Okay, today's video is entitled Induct AC Inductive Reactants Part 1. In this video, I'm trying to go over phase shift, phasor diagrams, and frequency for pure inductive circuits. I'm trying to do it in 10 minutes or less, so let's get started. This is the basic circuit di diagram that we're going to use. This circuit only contains an inductor, which is a coil of wire, which we designate L, and a time varying voltage source. So we have an AC voltage source, we have a voltage source, and inductor. We have no resistors, no capacitor. We have a pure inductive circuit. And this is the circuit that we're going to be talking about. And this, are, these are the waveforms that we get for the current. The what blue line represents the current through the circuit, and the red line represents the voltage across the inductor. Now, before I come back to and talk about this a little more detail, I tried to come up with a nice definition for inductive reactance. And the definition I come up with that the inductive reactance is the opposition to the change in current through the inductor. Inductors, as you know, do not like to have the current through them changed. But when the current through the inductor does change, it will react to the change in current by inducing a voltage across the inductor. And according to Lenz's law, if you remember Lenz's law, that the polarity of the induced voltage will be such that it will try to maintain the current through the inductor at a constant rate. Now what that basically means is that the voltage across the inductor is a reaction to the rate of change of the current. The current is changing over time. As you can see, the current is changing over time, and that will result in a time-changing voltage also. Okay, The voltage is a reaction to the rate of change of the current. But now you'll notice that the peak voltage and the peak current do not occur at the same time. The peak voltage and the peak current do not occur at the same time. The voltage waveform and the current waveform are out of phase with each other. So we want to write that down. Remember that for pure inductive circuits, the voltage and the current are out of phase. And you'll notice that the voltage always leads the current. If this is our time axis, that the peak voltage always occurs before the peak current, the peak voltage before the current, the peak voltage before the current, and the voltage leads the current, and the distance between the peak voltage and the peak current is pi over 2 radians, or 90 degrees. So we want to write that down. We want to state that the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees. Okay? Now, we want to remember that, and we have a simple device that we can use to remember that, and that is L-E-L-I. E, -L -I. e is for the EMF, or the voltage. E is for voltage. L tells us we're using this device for our inductive circuits and I is the current and you can see using LE for inductive circuit that the voltage leads the current. Okay, The voltage always occurs or the peak voltage always occurs before the peak current E before I for an inductive circuit. Now we can calculate the peak we can calculate the current at any given time using this equation. The current at time T is equal to the maximum current times the sine of omega T. Omega being the angular velocity of the source times the time. And we can also calculate the voltage across the inductor at time t is equal to the maximum voltage times the sine of omega t plus 90, y plus 90, because the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees. So please remember, for an inductive circuit where you have only a source and inductor, no resistors, no capacitors, the voltage leads the current okay, by 90 degrees, and that the voltage and the current are, of course, therefore, always out of phase. Now we can represent that difference in phase with a phasor diagram. A phasor diagram is basically a graphical representation of that. We want to remember that the voltage leads the current. We have our ELI to remember that. And we're going to plot the vector for the current and the vector for the maximum voltage across the inductor. And typically we plot the maximum current vector on the positive x-axis the voltage across the inductor on the positive y-axis. You can see we have a 90 degree angle between those two, and that's just a graphical representation of the fact that the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees, or pi over two radians. That's a phasor diagram. Okay, now this next slide, I wanna go through a full cycle and talk about what happens to the current and how the voltage responds to that. And we wanna remember that the voltage across the inductor is a reaction to the rate of change of the current through the inductor. Basically, the rate of change is basically the slope. And that really tells us this statement can be represented by this equation, that the voltage, the EMF, is equal to the inductance of the inductor times the rate of change of the current. This is di over dt. 
T, there's a little calculus. Okay, di over dt, it's a rate of change of the current over time. Now you'll notice that the current curve is a sine wave. The voltage curve is a cosine wave. If you remember a little bit of calculus, that the derivative of the sine wave is the cosine. And the derivative of a curve is really the slope of that curve at any point. So we're going to look at some key points for the current, and that will give us some hints about or tell us what the voltage is actually going to be. Okay, so what we know now is that the voltage across the inductor is equal to the slope of the current curve. The current curve is a sine curve. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. Okay, now I'm going to go through each quarter cycle for one cycle and talk about what's happening to the current and how the voltage responds to that. Okay, so we're going to do that for 0 to pi over 2, and then we're going to do that for up to pi, and then up to 3 pi over 2, and then for a full cycle, 2 pi. Okay, for the first quarter cycle, you can see the rate of change of the current is decreasing. The current curve is getting less steep. The slope of the current curve is decreasing. In fact, we're at this critical point right here, at the very top of the maximum current. The slope of the current curve is zero. And we said the slope of the current is equal to the voltage. And you can see right here that the voltage is zero. That's why these two are out of phase with each other. So the rate of change of the current is going to zero, and that means that the voltage across the inductor is also going to zero. And that's at the end of the first quarter cycle. Okay? Now for the next quarter, you'll notice that the current curve is getting steeper. The rate of change of the current is increasing. It's going from zero, and right where this current curve passes the zero line, it's actually at its maximum increase over time, it has its maximum slope. So the rate of change of the current is at its maximum. This curve has a negative slope, so we have negative here, and that results in our maximum but negative instantaneous voltage across the inductor. Okay, and for the next quarter cycle, the current begins to decrease again. The rate of change of the current is decreasing. The slope is getting, going back to zero. The IDT is going to zero, and that tells us that once again, the voltage is going to zero. Remember, the slope of the current is equal to the voltage. Now, for the last quarter, the rate of change of the current is increasing again as it comes back to the zero line. It's getting steeper, and the rate of change of the current is increasing. It's increasing in the positive direction because that curve has a positive slope there, and therefore at our maximum positive voltage. All right? So that's what's occurring through the coil with the current and the responding voltage for one cycle, and then, of course, just repeats itself over time. Okay, now the next thing I want to do is talk about the frequency dependence of the reactants, inductive reactants. And you can see this is the equation we use to calculate the inductive reactant. XL is a symbol for inductive reactants. X is inductance, excuse me, reactants. X is for the in inductor. And the inductive reactants equal to 2 times pi times the frequency source times the inductance of the inductor. We can also use this equation, inductive reactants equal to omega times L. All right, I just want to point out that XL is the inductive reactance in ohms, F is the frequency of the source in hertz, and L is the inductance of the inductor. Now, also, omega is equal to 2 pi F, so we can just substitute omega for 2 pi F, and we can also use this equation. Okay? Now, most of the time, when we have a circuit, 2 is always a constant, pi is always a constant. Most of the times we pick an inductor and we use that inductor and then we can vary the voltage or vary the frequency of the source. And when we do that, that will tell us that the inductive reactance is directly proportional to the frequency of the source. Okay, as the frequency goes up, the inductive goes up. As the frequency goes down, the inductance goes down. So let's just look at that in a little bit more detail because that's an important part of inductive reactance. It's the opposite of capacitive reactance. Inductive reactance is directly proportional to the frequency of the source. As the frequency increases, then the inductance is going to, the reactance is going to be increasing. And if the in reactance increases, then that's like the resistance is increasing. And then at a high enough frequency, the coil, the inductor, will begin to act like an open circuit and no current will be able to flow through it. 
if we decrease the frequency, <coughs> excuse me, then the reactance will decrease, the resistance decreases basically, and the circuit begins to, or the coil begins to act like a short circuit, okay? Like simply like a wire. All right, so that was everything I wanted to go over for this video and inductive reactance. We went over the phase difference, we went over phasor diagrams, and we went over the, finally the frequency dependence of the inductance and the fact that it's directly proportional to the frequency. Okay, so I hopefully you found that video helpful. If you did, please do all the following three things. Subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up for this video, and leave me a nice positive comment in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next video.